Okay, is this thing on? Can you hear me? You can clap if you can hear me. I'm guessing <laughs> you. you don't have to clap. Uh, my name is Kanye Makuela. I am a managing partner at Kindred Ventures. Uh, we are based in San Francisco and have been investing in uh, early stage technology all over the world. Um, I'm so pleased to be joined by uh, one of our portfolio founders, uh, Heikel Balti from Faircraft, who's based in Paris. So let's get started. Uh, Heikel, tell me, um, what inspired you to start Faircraft? So maybe you can talk a tiny bit about your background and your co-founder's background and how you got started. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Kanye. So it all came from an encounter uh, between myself and Cesar, my co-founder in CTO. So before meeting Cesar, uh, I was working in the hardware uh, field, uh, designing um, hardware products such as smartwatches, uh, smart medical devices. And I wanted to uh, create my own company uh, within a field uh, that uh, both had physical uh, aspects to it, so creating a physical product with a high impact. So I joined a program called Entrepreneur First in Paris, and that's how I met uh, César. César, on his end, he, was, uh, he had spent 12 years in academia, working uh, across different fields of biology with a specific focus on skin cells. So that's how we met. Uh, my background was manufacturing hardware products in large quantities. His was focused on skin and skin cells. So we had this idea of recreating lab-grown skin at scale to turn it into leather. Okay, so lab-grown skin to turn it into leather. A lot of people have been talking about alternative leather for, at this point, 20, 25 years. I mean, pleather is probably even older than that. Uh, what was the inspiration for the concept, particularly of in vitro leather, and what makes it different to some of the other leathers out there in the alternative space? Uh -huh. So, first, leather is basically coming from a skin, an animal skin, a skin that is then tanned uh, to turn it into leather. So, we, we, we remove sorry, hair, fat, the unnecessary tissue to get basically the, the end leather. So, that's traditional leather. The, Traditional, I would say, alternatives were uh, mostly plastic, uh, polyurethane, uh, different types of blends of polyurethanes, or other polymers, and then started to come other uh, substitutes, I would say, such as the vegan leathers, which are, in most cases, blends of plants, uh, for example, uh, pineapple leaves or other types of plants, uh, blended with, once again, plastic. So when we had this idea, the first thing we did is that we troubleshot, uh, tried to, understood, uh, to understand the market, um, and we saw a lot of interest in not trying to replicate the material with things that didn't have anything to, 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 to go with at the first place, but really to have the same architecture, the same biocontent as what we would have in leather. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like you're saying that you're making actual leather, mm -hmm. so the same thing as the animal skin, but you're just making it in a lab, is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. So to talk a bit about the process, so what we're doing is that we go from a skin biopsy, tiny skin biopsy, harmless skin biopsy, that uh, we take from basically an animal skin, uh, cow, lamb, um, different types of, uh, of animals. Then we extract the relevant cells, uh, which work is basically to recreate collagen, elastin, that we find into a, into a, a leather. So that's what we do. We go from a skin biopsy, we extract the cells, we cultivate them, multiply them, and make sure that they produce collagen in large quantities so that we get a lab-grown skin. So when we call it alter alternative leather, would it actually be more accurate to just call it leather? Yeah, sure. So when we look at the definition of leather, it's basically a material that comes from skin, that ha keeps the structure of skin, and that is modified, stabilized using a tanning process. So that's all what we do. So we're, it's coming from a skin, we get the same structure and we tan it to stabilize uh, the performance of the material. Okay, so it sounds a little bit like it's maybe closer to like a lab-grown diamond, where it actually has all of the same molecular properties, chemical properties, performance properties. So I'm curious about that, because lab-grown diamonds is one of the fascinating areas for me. It works. You can get perfect cut, perfect clarity, perfect color. You can have the absolute best diamond, and yet, they're kind of worse. <laughs> uh, people still want the diamonds that are coming out of the ground. Uh, you know, it, it is different to give an engagement ring if it's a lab-grown diamond engagement ring than if it's, a, you know, than if it's an actual diamond. 
is the same true in your opinion of leather? So is lab-grown leather going to be like lab-grown diamonds? I don't think so. Uh, I think that uh, for multiple reasons, um, we, so it's kind of a different case. Uh, the first reason is that step one for us is to get the materials that looks like leather, which the touch and feel is similar to leather, with a performance that is similar to leather. That's step one. But what we're doing actually is that we're able to produce materials with augmented performance, with features that you cannot get with the regular leather. So we can fine tune the porosity of the material, the breathability of the material, uh, different aspects regarding the thickness, uh, the usability of the material. And so for this very reason, we believe that this is an opportunity to go further uh, and beyond what we, we are getting with regular leather. I see. So it sounds a little bit like you're trying to not just match the utility of the status quo, but improve it. Is that, is that a, a fair, a fair set? Yeah, definitely. So um, we often approach it through the lens of sustainability. So our solution produces 10 times less CO2 equivalent. We use 20, 25 times less water than for the regular leather. So many different aspects are very... Um, we have a high environmental performance around our material. But in terms of, I would say, purchasing behavior, uh, going towards these new solutions, we believe it's not enough. Uh, it's not a strong enough push towards like, having uh, people buying the, 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 the material and the products made of this material. So that's why we're working on making it even better. Why isn't it a strong enough push? Why isn't it being eco-friendly good enough? I think it's, 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 it's very good, uh, but uh, when we look at, I would say, customer behaviors, uh, we see a lot of, I would say, discrepancy across uh, age classes. There is an upcoming uh, Generation Z, which is uh, highly uh, focused on uh, values, not so attached on brands. Um, values related to environmental impact are very important, but still, we need to bring more to the table. Sounds a little bit like the development of the um of the first um, hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles. So I remember when the Prius was first launched, it was a pretty cool breakthrough technology. It was a really interesting car. It was appealing to uh, a demographic of people who wanted to be eco-conscious. But it wasn't until the Tesla came out that you suddenly had an aspirational car because it was a really fast car. It was fast as a Ferrari, and it was a luxury car. So it sounds like it's a, a similar case study that you're trying to make. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So what, uh, what we're seeing and the feedback and uh, the, what we're getting from our clients within the luxury fashion segment is that the material needs to be uh, desirable. So we need to, to add this sexiness around like the solution that not only pushes the aspects related to uh, eco-friendliness, but really makes it... Uh, uh, sexy beyond the aspects of, uh, I would say, eco-friendliness and uh, e efficiency. Okay. So before we continue into this thread of better understanding the sort of luxury positioning, um, how far has anybody gone in actually creating this leather? Like, what's the biggest sheet of lab-grown leather that, uh, I guess, prior to Faircraft has, has ever been produced? So... Prior to uh, Faircraft, so we founded the company in 2021. Uh, so we were not the first ones to, uh, to create a, a company aiming at like, reproducing uh, leather using cell biology, cell culture. There were two companies uh, founded before us, uh, one in the Netherlands and one in the US. But they remained at very small, I would say, uh, uh, capabilities in terms of size of manufacturing, in terms of... How uh, small? Like basically petri dish uh, size. Petri dish. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And is that just because it was hard? Like, what's what makes that hard? Why? What were the, without you know getting into too many of the technical details, but what were the basic blockers mm -hmm. of of breakthrough here? I think that there are multiple aspects uh, that come more generally with uh, bringing a company from basically the the the, the bench, uh, the lab bench to the market. Uh, making the science work is a first a challenge by itself. So we're in a field where there is very little uh, publications, and so we're doing actual science within the company. We're doing work that nobody has ever done, uh, which allows us basically to recreate lab-grown skin in a way that is very efficient to make it at scale. So that's the second aspect, making sure that we have the right manufacturing processes 
along the way uh, is also a challenge by itself. So it's not only about the science. It's also about like, how you manufacture it with the right processes, finding the right partners, and being able like, to manufacture sometimes to produce some of the specific equipment that you need to grow these, uh, these skins at scale. So when you say you're doing something nobody's ever done, maybe just we'll use the Tesla analogy again. Like, uh, somebody once described Tesla as like, it's the first time somebody has successfully put a battery on wheels. Now, while that's an engineering innovation, it's an engineering innovation. It's not like a scientific breakthrough. You haven't invented a new... Uh, you're not going to win a Nobel Prize for that or anything like that, right? Uh, when it comes to what you're doing, you're talking about bench science. You're talking about the lab. You're talking about uh, pipetting and, yeah. and you know, the, the putting things in beakers and the thing turning blue, the eureka, right? <laughs> so uh, is that where you're saying you've had some breakthroughs or is it on the engineering side? On both. Uh, basically. On both. Yeah, wow. exactly. So what we have done is that we have creating the company, uh, we have created an applied research team and industri an industrialization team at the same time. We decided to hire the two at the same time. So the applied research team works basically on making a great material in terms of uh, composition, in terms of touch and feel, uh, and works also on the cost structure at a gross margin level, I would say, like making sure that the raw materials at, are at the right cost structure. So that's the applied research team. The industrialization team makes sure that Anything that happens within the Petri dish scales well uh, at hundreds of thousands or millions of square meters per month. And so that's why we decided to create the two companies at the same time, because we needed to innovate on the two aspects at the same time. It's funny, it sounds a little bit like, um, like an open AI or an anthropic in the like, corporate structure. And so I'm curious, particularly if there's you know, deep tech and hard tech founders in the room, if they can draw some lessons from the way you've structured the company, because on the one hand, you have actual scientific researchers that are trying to, to make uh, in-lab breakthroughs, but then you have pure manufacturing, engineering, commercialization leaders as well. Uh -huh. uh, do you think that that's a model that's becoming more popular and is gonna, you're going to see more of in the market? I think it's uh, more popular, and I think that it's a necessity, uh, because... We're doing hardcore science. Uh, we needed to get real breakthrough science-wise in order to make the process work. In order to do it, we had to hire people from all over the world, coming from many places, and in many times from academia. The thing is, like, people who came to the company from academia had great backgrounds, scientifically speaking, but the metrics were not the same. Like, the metrics when you're in academia about publishing, finding uh, breakthroughs are not the ones that necessarily we're expecting in a private company. Um, and so having this mix of, I would say, backgrounds, like people coming from these hardcore scientific backgrounds, but at the same time, people thinking, OK, how am I going to supply this raw material? How am I going to manufacture it at scale? Um, how am I managing the risks of uh, like moving parts uh, around, storing, etc.? Makes everything very practical, and this is required to make what we're doing work. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about commercialization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Hekel told me that he cold emailed the, C the COO of one of the largest European luxury, uh, luxury brands and, and, and went on LinkedIn yeah, and exactly. just said, hey, my name is Hekel, <laughs> I have a startup, can you talk to me? Uh, and she responded. Uh, talk to me about your sort of building into the luxury market and starting to have some sort of commercial success there. I'd love to better understand that. Yeah, definitely. So um, when we met with Cesar, even before like, incorporating the company, we needed to uh, make sure that there was an actual business uh, around what we wanted to do. So the quickest uh, way to, to understand it was to talk to the decision makers. I was not from the industry, so basically I went to LinkedIn, very short messages, explaining, all right, this is what we want to do. We believe it's a real problem for you. Is it the case? And if so, would you be willing to have a chat with us in the coming days? Completely cold. Completely cold. What kind of industry. companies are we talking about? The biggest, biggest luxury fashion houses uh, we all know. Like the ones I'm thinking of? Yeah, the ones okay. that you're thinking of. Okay. Yeah. And they responded? <laughs> they responded literally within minutes. Why? Because that's a key problem for them. So when we... So we did this with basically the, the five major luxury fashion groups, luxury fashion houses. 
and everyone was, uh, showed the same interest. And the thing is, they had been looking for similar so solutions for a decade. Uh, one of these fashion houses explained to us that they had been financing labs to try to do this for uh, eight years when we talked to them in 2020 without any success. So they were like, OK, this is a real problem for us because we have an environmental impact uh, problem. We have a sourcing problem. So that's why main, most of the uh, luxury fashion houses have acquired tanneries to make sure that they would be able to source the materials. Uh, and they're also thinking about how to address these upcoming uh, generations who are looking for, once again, values uh, and brands which are impactful in a positive way. And so many of these aspects made uh, like what we were doing very interesting to them. So from the very beginning, they offered to help across many different uh, ways, um, helping us with, uh, with uh, uh, staff, expertise, equipment, uh, projects, co-development projects, proof concepts, many, many ways. Let me ask a different kind of question, which I've, had, I've been wondering a little bit about. What makes a bag from Chanel or Hermes a luxury bag? Like, what's the difference between an, an, an Hermes bag and a Zara bag? Uh -huh. So when we look at the material, the materials are better. So there are different grades of leather. What, is better, what does better mean? Better in terms of uh, uniformity, for example, in terms of uh, texture or in terms of color. So that's one first aspect. But the key aspect is all the craftsmanship around it. So once again, I was not from the field. Uh, and so when I started working with these brands, I saw why luxury was so uh, interesting for so many people, because like. Really, we went to some of the l largest like fashion uh, houses uh, uh, workshops, and we saw all the craftsmanship around it. So the people were trained like for eight to ten years to be able like to put their hands on the bag, just to be able to polish it. So there is really this all this craftsmanship. Wait, what do you what do you mean by that? It means that uh, uh, eight to ten years just to polish. Uh, eight to like ten, literally eight to just ten to years polish? To of training uh, on some of the techniques just to be able like, to polish with a specific uh, uh, process uh, that was created 200 years ago. Wow. And so there is really this level of, uh, I would say, um, yeah, quality that you don't find anywhere else, and attention to detail and attention to craftsmanship. OK. So you take this craftsmanship and this attention to detail and fundamentally unscalable activity, yep. and you need to figure out how to intersect it with a, you know, a scale manufacturing startup. Uh, what is it about your mechanism that fits that model, or does it break that model, actually? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's, it fits pretty well within the model. So that's part of the questions that they're asking. OK, are you going to manufacture this in huge scales, and how do, you, do we basically uh, find ourselves, like if you start like selling this to the automotive industry, how are we managing basically the, these materials that we buy and sell like to the high-end segments while you're selling also to other ones? And so the key for us is really this ability to fine-tune the material to create uh, different grades of materials as well. We can fine-tune the level of the amount of collagen, uh, the composition, uh, which has a direct impact on the cost of the material, which has a direct impact on how much we will sell to them. Okay, so maybe we can skip ahead to the fun part, which is how is your progress? Where are you? You were saying that the status quo is the petri dish when you got started in 2021. Uh, I think you had been talking about how there was like a, a little sheet of leather that you could actually finally produce. How far along are you in the development? Yeah, exactly. So 2021 was uh, when we first met, actually, uh, when you invested uh, during our seed round. At the time, we had a tiny, tiny piece of material, which, uh, to be honest, didn't look much like leather at the time. Uh, Will which, you show it? Do you have an image of yeah, it? Yeah, I'll show it, and I'll show you where we are now also. So this is where we were in 2021, wow. and this is what we're able to produce now. Uh, and so in 2021, we basically had this tiny material showing that we were able like, to cultivate cells, produce collagen within like, basically this, uh, this tiny sample. And now we're able, basically, to produce full pieces uh, with our process. So this took a lot of science, but also a lot of process engineering, finding the right way to manufacture, uh, manufacture this at the right quality level um, and with processes that, uh, that scale. So is this an actual leather bag? Yeah, it is. 
smells like leather. Uh, talk to me about how far this is in the development of, oh wow, it's interesting, it even has the suede on the yep. inside. Talk to me about how far this development is towards the goal of like a, a Birkin bag or, or, you know, one of the classic sort of true luxury bags. How far uh -huh. along are you in, in the development of this product? And also, nope. how many of these have been made by you or by anyone in the market? It sounds like you're probably at first. Or yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's the first ever uh, lab-grown bag. Uh, this is the first ever? Yeah, and this is the first time we're oh. showing it, so, yeah. Okay. And so, uh, the thing is... Hold like, on. Is yeah. the first time you're ever showing it as well? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get a round of applause for <laughs> <when I come. laughs> Thank okay. you. It's really cool, man. Congratulations. Thanks so much. Really, really neat. Anyway, but, so, but talk to me so, about, um, but about how... how far we are from, from this starting point, I suppose, to, to it being a bag that I'll, you know, that I'll spend too much money on in the store. Yeah, sure. So uh, we're addressing the fashion, luxury fashion segment. Uh, and so within this segment, actually, there are like different cultures within different brands. So the brands are really about having something that um, is specific to them. So for some of the brands, we're working towards tuning the material so that it gets like the special touch of this specific brand. This is one way of... each brand's leather has its own touch. Yeah, yeah, so kind of. If you work at Louis Vuitton or Chanel and you're closing your eyes and you're touching a bag, you can tell. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes it's about the touch and feel, sometimes it's about uh, the finish, the color. Uh, so it really depends on the, on, the, on, the, on the brand. Some of the brands they are, I would say, much faster into, in uh, taking decisions in uh, uh, wanting to put this, uh, these products on the market. So we're pretty close, actually. Wow, fantastic. Okay, uh, so as a founder, from 2021, just looking at the slide here, to 2024, you've been able to go from bench research to, to this. Yep. Uh, what do you think about your approach has been really unique and differentiated? And what are some of the lessons that you might if you could reflect a little bit on the last three years, share with, share with the audience for how we should be thinking about other hard tech companies, other people mm. who are trying to both create scientific breakthroughs but actually commercialize it into something yeah. that you can hold. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the very first, uh, I would say, months were super important. Uh, so we did two things. We uh, talked to a lot of people within the market. Uh, so there is a very useful book, very short one called The Mom Test trying to understand basically if what we were thinking about was really relevant to the industry or if it was just a gimmick. So we really spent time like, talking to the luxury fashion segment, with the fashion segment in general, the automotive segment as well. Uh, uh, automotive? Furniture. Yeah, automotive. Oh, also. right, because lug leather chairs, leather... Yeah, exactly. Uh. So a huge market, and we really wanted to understand it uh, and understand the in and outs and what needed to be done on this market. And so that was very important, and that's how we got all these brands on board very early on. And this is what told us, okay, you need to go this way. You don't need to create a lab-grown skin in general, like with all the, uh, I, don't, I don't know, uh, vascularity, nerves, etc. Like this is the interesting part of leather, or of the skin for leather, so please focus on this. So this feedback was super helpful. And once again, even before creating the company. The second aspect was uh, making sure that um, we took the right track, scientifically speaking, by constantly challenging uh, the, the scale-up aspect. So Cesar, my co-founder, once again, great scientist, hardcore scientist, top of his field on uh, what we're doing. And my background was manufacturing. So basically, the first months were really about like back and forth. OK, this is what you want to do. Does it scale well? Uh, should we do it a bit differently so that we're able basically to do it in a way that makes sense economically speaking? It's not about like making the best lab-grown skin ever, uh, the most physiological uh, lab-grown skin ever. It's about like making the best lab-grown skin to make the best leather and even more. How soon will I be able to uh, buy an anniversary present for my wife <laughs> a, as a, as a lab-grown bag? Hopefully soon. Uh, so we're working uh, with... Uh, weeks, months, years, or decades? A few years. A few years, maybe two to three years, I would say. Wow. Uh, so we're working with brands. Uh, so we have these uh, sales cycles, which can be a bit long also with the B2B companies. It's also an aspect to consider. Um, but in our case, 
It's basically, um, I would say, two years. Two years is a good timeline. Wow. Well, this is an absolutely amazing achievement, and you know, it's, it's really cool, and I wish everybody could smell it. It actually smells <laughs> like leather, so I, I congratulate you on all you've accomplished, and um, look forward to seeing these out, on, out in the stores soon. So <laughs> awesome. Hey, Kilbalti, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.